Welcome everybody to the Invasive Strike Force survey training. We are going to be talking about species ID today. Really excited to have everybody here and see all the familiar names um, and some new ones. Uh, so welcome to our program. And uh, my name is Dr. Brent Boscarino. I'm the Associate Director of Stewardship here at the Trail Conference. I'll be talking about how my role has shifted from years past for those who I've worked with and kind of explain where the program is headed and where it's been. So before we start, I was just following a chat. I always like asking that initial question, what brings you here, right? Well, a lot of the trail conference volunteers in the past come because they love hiking. Um, and for a lot of folks, it's just all about getting to the summit, right? To the top. It's that, it's, whether it's the exercise or just seeing the views or whatever, um, you know, it, that, that's what brings a lot of people to the trail conference and loving the outdoors. We also have a lot of our volunteers that are really into uh, gardening. We have a lot of master gardener volunteers with us that become surveyors down the road. And it's just that touch and feel of the soil that's really inspiring to them. So in the past, um, you know, I, I think I've, for most of you who have worked with me before, I used to be a teacher. So I used to work with high school students and with, uh, but I was in a K through 12 setting. And there's just always something really thrilling about working with kids and just seeing that level of excitement for exploring. For all of the gardeners out there and all of the hikers out there, this is an opportunity to not just think about that pursuit, that one pursuit, but it's to, to stop and really look at what's around you and why that uh, nature experience for you is not just about the flowers that you're putting in your garden or getting up to that summit, but it's about the stuff that's around it, that exploration, the, the wildlife and plants that are around it that make that nature experience whole. So when I was in my former role at the trail conference, I was the invasive species citizen science program coordinator. So it was my job to really inspire action, to take that whatever that verve was for being outdoors, take it to the next level to really learn about what was on the trails and how we wanna preserve those natural areas for future generations. So to kind of combine that love for the outdoors with the de desire to explore that kind of sense of wonder about the natural world we all had when we were younger. So as part of that job, I was uh, you know, training volunteers and many of you on this call have been longtime volunteers. So thank you to help track invasive species and protect our native habitats in the lower Hudson Valley and in Northern New Jersey, of course, uh, being uh, hosted by the, uh, by the trail conference. Now, that being said, this is just a bit of an update for those of you who have been longtime volunteers. I am now the Associate Director of Stewardship. So uh, if you have not heard that Linda Roll Leader is no longer at the trail conference and I'm sort of taking over that leadership role here. So I'm no longer the Citizen Science Program Coordinator and I'm actually directing a lot, all of our stewardship based programs here at the trail conference, including the invasive species work. So I'm not going anywhere. I'll still be here teaching and working with you guys. It's part of the job that I love the most is working with you all. Uh, you guys are an amazing group to work with, but um, just, just wanted to give an update that here we are at the, the, the trail conference, the stewardship department, we are still rolling. We've got a full seasonal crew out there. Here's a look at, um, a past crew that takes a lot of the survey work. There's a volunteer that does the survey work and passes over that data that you guys have collected over the years and uh, helps make us uh, helps us make decisions for these seasonal crews that come in that work with AmeriCorps to remove these invasive species that threaten the trails and natural areas that we love. Um, we also have bug squatter, squashers that were part of our volunteer team last year. Here's a couple of volunteers working on spotted lanternfly, which we will get to in a moment. Um, we also have an aquatics team. So we have an, a seasonal uh, AmeriCorps crew that comes in. They just started last week and is uh, removing priority species in lakes, ponds, and other um, water systems in our region as well. And we also have the wonderful gardeners who come and, and cr help create and nurture our native habitat in front of Trail Conference headquarters. And our stewardship department would not be complete without our conservation dogs team. And here is our ambassador dog, Dia, with her Rex specs on, getting ready for some invasive species surveying work. So for those of you unfamiliar with the Trail Conference, we have a dogs program that can sniff out invasive species and native species as well. So just an overview of our department, where we're going. A lot of these things are staying the same, but some, as you'll see today, like our survey program, it's just taking a slightly different turn. 
So uh, as to where invasive species fit into the Trail Conference's mission, well, you know, the Trail Conference has been around for over 100 years. Uh, volunteers did all the work here just for designing these trails, maintaining them, protecting open spaces through advocacy, educating the public about responsible use like leave no trace on the trails that we all love and, and we visit in the parks that, that we cherish, right? But many of you may not know that we also helped to coordinate the regional response to invasive species. And we started this, uh, this stewardship department and it, this invasive species response in 2012. And that is done through a contract that we have with New York State um, through the Lower Hudson Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management, or LH PRISM for short. And what these are, are these are just regions, there's eight of them throughout New York State that are really focused in on invasive species management and the threat that it causes to our natural areas and, our, and the parks. So the Lower Hudson PRISM is essentially a network of environmental organizations, sometimes it's people, all getting together, we have over 65 partners that plan and plot and do removal and surveying and stuff like that, uh, all having to, uh, with, with a vetted interest in invasive species. You can look at our region here. Um, it's all the way from Manhattan, all the way up to Northern Ulster in Dutchess County. Um, but because we are hosted, the PRISM itself is hosted by the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. We have a really robust volunteer presence in Northern New Jersey as well. And that's where you guys come in. I'm sure there's a lot of New Jersey folks that are on this call today. But that's the question. Trail Conference has been around for hundred years. So why is the Trail Conference, you know, are we doing enough already? Why invasive species? What's the, what's the point? Well, ask any trail maintainer, which we have historically done. The, this is the main thing that they have been working on for years, our invasive species and their inf infringement upon trail corridors, and getting through these natural spaces that we love that we love to see. So the vast majority of what trail maintainers are cutting back are invasive species that have come here and have taken over a lot of the forested lands and understory of these trails. So it makes sense to partner invasive species surveying and removal with what the trail conference has been doing for a century now, is essentially creating op these open spaces and responsibly using them. Um, invasive species are not just a local concern or a regional concern. They are thought to be by the IUCN. So IUCN creates this red list and is probably the greatest, uh, uh, the largest global uh, database for threatened and endangered species um, in, in the world. Um, have, have basically said that invasive species are the second biggest driver of species extinction. Um, here in the United States, it is pro probably the number one threat to biodiversity. This is not a small issue here. Um, we spend a lot of time and resources and energy in trying to keep invasive species out, and most of them started as cultivated species that then escaped. Um, and this is exactly what happens when they escape. Here you have a plant that was that evolved in another region. It's usually a lot of our invasive plants come from Eastern Asia. You put them, they look pretty. Here are berries of oriental bittersweet that are just put on a pergola. Well, they're just there, just hanging out, right? Well, there are birds, wildlife, and things that are eating these things, then pooping out those seeds. And this is what you see now when you're driving along interstates, when you're in some of the parks, um, just completely blanketing the native trees that we have been a part of, right? So that, and, and we love and cherish. So this is what we are trying to prevent is the, is the next oriental bittersweet, the next Japanese barberry, which you all have dealt with and seen, right? We are trying to prevent this from happening because this is what happens when invasive species escape and start taking over landscapes. You tell me what kind of tree is under there. You have no idea. It's just completely blanketed with bittersweet. Um, it also has really large impacts on, on the economy as well. So huge losses to forestry, agriculture, tourism. We spend over $120 billion a year here at the U.S. on invasive species control and management, which is an insane number. That is way more than, than all of Europe spends. Australia spends quite a bit of money as well, but nothing compared to what the United States is spending. Um, it is a huge threat to biodiversity in our areas. Um, and all of this work involves cooperation and commitment. We could not do this. The staff, the PRISM staff, the Trail Conference staff could not do it without our volunteers, our PRISM partners, our Conservation Corps members, as I said, 
our state agency partners, and our research institutions. So all of this kind of comes together to make this thing work and go. Um, in terms of the volunteers and why you guys are here to learn and help us out is that we're a really small staff. Our, we only have seasonal cores and even our seasonal core is like five members, right? We need a community to do it. And that's why we started the Invasive Strike Force in 2011 and really kind of took off in 2012 as an effort to detect and manage the spread of invasive species in forested parklands. Um, citizen science is the key. We cannot do this alone. This cannot just be research institutions and the trail conference staff doing this. It really requires a whole community effort to get this done. And that's where you guys come in to help us with the surveying, collect information about what invasive species exist, how abundant they are along our trails, and um, you know, to help us map these things. All of this work that our volunteers engage in to identify these invasive species along our trails, then as used as part of our PRISM partner network and planning and regional strategy, we can take all of that data, put it on maps of our trail system and get a really good sense of where invasive species are, where they're infringing upon. So let's take a look at Scunamonk State Park. Here's some data that came back from some of our volunteers. You can see that there are certain parts of the trail that are really highly invaded. But a lot of that trail system is actually really pristine. So we can use the data that you guys are collecting to make strategic management decisions. Like maybe we could have a removal day in this part of Scunamonk State Park. Maybe we could remove whatever invasive species is there that our, that our volunteers have collected data on and then really deploy a good volunteer work day or our seasonal crews to go out there and get it done. So we have these huge volunteer work days. You know, this is just one example at the at the old Crow Aqueduct, for example. If it requires chemical removals, we can deploy our seasonal core crews to go out and uh, apply herbicides when when it's right. And other times, we just have these large volunteer work days based on the data that you guys are collecting to keep our trails free and clear from these invasive species. So that is where it all comes in. Now, for those of you who are longtime surveyors. You were looking at common invasive species along our trail system. So what was said, what was in the past, our standard species, our common invasive species list. What you're looking at here is that once a species is established, like all of those species in our standard are common invasive species, things like bittersweet, Japanese barberry, multiflora rose. At that point in time, it's important to get a baseline map of where those species are but it takes a lot of time and effort at that point to control those species. We're really kind of in you know, maintenance at that point, trail maintainers cutting these things back to avoid the treadway. But where the, really the, the hard work comes in, we are really trying with the invasive strike force effort this year and what our crew is trying to accomplish and what um, you know, management is really focused on is in this early detection rapid response window. So the species that you're gonna be learning about today and helping us map, go in on this early part of the invasion where you've got small number of localized populations of new invasive species that have come in. And there's a window of opportunity where if you guys help, can help with the mapping, we can move in and keep it from expanding from the region versus a lot of the common invasive species are so widespread, there's not a heck of a lot that we can do about it other than um, you know, just maintenance and cutting it back. But here, the species you're gonna be learning about today, we really are on the cutting edge of and really wanna to respond to very, very quickly. So that's where the effort is going towards high priority emerging invasive species. Christy, how are we doing? Any uh, comments come up so far? Nope, all good. Okay, audio and video is coming out all right? Yep. All right, folks, are you ready? Drum roll, please. We are about to embark on the five species that we are gonna be focusing on this year. In the past, we've looked at 14 common invasive species and 11 emerging ones, but now it's time for a, kind of a change here. We have this wonderful, robust 10 year data set of all of the common invasive species that we have mapped over all this time. That is the critical baseline that we needed to know 
the distribution of these common and, and in some cases emerging invasive species in our region. This year is really focused on these five priority ones and that, that the state has identified, that New Jersey has identified as important and we are gonna tackle as a group together. So let's take a look. Our first one guys is one that I am particularly concerned about and there is a lot of talk within our prison region on beech leaf disease. Beech leaf disease, is ha, uh, has really been devastating out in Ohio. It's a disease that's caused that causes this dark banding and tissue thickening on beech trees in our region. Um, we are still trying to figure out what exactly is the causative agent of this. It's thought to be associated with an invasive nematode worm, a really tiny microscopic worm that burrows itself within the buds of these beech trees and eventually ends up causing damage to the leaves as well. Um, and we are seeing at, when you get this striping and tissue thickening that eventually the leaves end up falling off, the tree uh, may, may die entirely and leading to overall reduction in canopy cover and eventual death. This disease started in, or was first found in beech trees in Ohio. You see this region that is right here, that was sort of the epicenter of the, where this disease was found. And then it kind of quickly spread east and north into Ontario, Canada, and then kind of expanded east through Pennsylvania. Um, with the Chinese beech tree is also thought to be a potential host, not just American beech. But as you can see, these blues are sort of the epicenter of where it started. And then it kind of jumped over here to the lower Hudson area um, and then kind of spread it spread east throughout Pennsylvania as well. And now it's found in Connecticut, New York, Maine and Virginia, even within the last year. Um, in terms of its symptoms, it's got this characteristic hallmark green striped bands between the leaf veins. The bands are a result of, again, tissue thickening, which impacts photosynthesis. And as it progresses, what ends up happening is that the trees will end up aborting their buds because they're not photosynthesizing. They know that something is, is wrong. The leaves end up curling up. You see this sort of like, ugh, it's just like death kind of falling over look to it. So it goes from this like um, banded appearance to kind of like keeling over a little bit till eventually you get the loss of the leaves. And this is really hitting the saplings very hard. They're severely affected and die within two years. And we are finding, at least in this early part of the invasion in our region, that the proportion of impacted trees, if you have one beach that's impacted, it's impacting um, uh, like the, the vast majority of them around them. But we are just now trying to map this in our region and really, really need your help with doing so. So I'm gonna show you, as if you're out there with me in the field, I'm doing a little field guide here. I'm gonna show you a video on how, what it actually looks like in the field. Um, and to give you a little bit of a better sense for what you might be seeing out there. And the first thing, of course, you need to realize is not just what beach leaf disease is, but you gotta learn how to identify a beach tree. So I'll be starting with that and then we'll be going from there. And for those of you who are accustomed to Zoom meetings, you'll realize that um, it's Zoom. So this video is gonna kind of jump around a little bit, but the audio should be coming clear for you. And you, you should be able to, even though it's kind of lagging behind and jumping a little bit, you'll get the basic features down and I'll stop the video occasionally. Here you go, guys. The first sign to look for that you're looking at a beech tree and not another type of tree is this bark. And a lot of people liken the bark of a beech tree to uh, almost like elephant legs. You can see why it's got like a grayish appearance to it. And as I'm feeling it, it's very, very smooth. Unfortunately, a lot of, uh, you know, you get a lot of carvings and stuff um, on the sides of beech trees, which are so this is annoying. You've probably seen people like I love so and so on beech trees because it's easy to carve into. Um, we are not promoting that, but I'm just saying that's another another sign, sort of this like very smooth bark. Are not promoting at all, uh, but uh, but again, it's just got this like very smooth appearance to it. It almost looks just like a, like a little joint there uh, of an, of an elephant leg or something. So that's one of the first features to be on the lookout for. Um, also, it's leaves because sometimes, especially with saplings and stuff you may not get um that that sort of smooth bark um at, but as it matures it becomes even more obvious but if you look at the beech leaf itself uh there's a little trick that i'll have you guys think of so when you think of beech 
um, and like going to the beach and waves. You see how this leaf right here, if you look at the surface of it where my finger's coming up there, doesn't that look like little wave crests like you're going to the beach? And that's a little trick that I use. Um, just to I always like to use little shortcuts for you guys, like wave, like as if you're, I don't know, your nine-year-old drew like waves on the beach. That's how I remember it. Hopefully it'll work for you it guys. It looks like little wave crests like you would see if you did a little like uh, artistic rendering of what waves might look like, kind of cresting up there. So in other words, each of these veins that's coming off that mid rib of the um, of, of the leaf in the middle there. So right where my thumb is kind of you see those veins, they're coming to a uh, there you go uh, coming to a point at the end where the wave will crest. So that's what I'm looking for in a beach leaf. It comes to a point at the end um, as well where my thumb is here. So right over there when I'm the diagnosing end. what a leaf uh, beach leaf looks like, those are the features that I'm looking for in addition to that like smooth elephant skin like bark. Remember that initial video I had of scanning the canopy and sort of that beautiful, brilliant look you have to uh, the canopy as you're looking up while you're hiking. Well, do you notice something a little bit off and strange about that as I'm looking? Okay, I'm going to pause the video here because this is important for you guys when you're out in the field. The best way to spot beech leaf disease is to look up at the tree through the light. You see the striping right here? That's the hallmark feature of it. And you can see that um, you'll see that very, very, very clearly. Uh, that there's this striping on these leaves. So I'll point that out in the video here. Looking up into the canopy here, take a look at some of these leaves here. You see that striping that's appearing as you're looking up into the canopy, into the, the, the sky but beyond it. Yep, that is the hallmark sign that unfortunately this forest that I am in uh, Putnam County in New York State has beech leaf disease. And I'm gonna show you in a second, but you can see that this is really advanced symptoms of that, almost like the curling of it. But I'll get a closer up look of it in a second of the really advanced version of beech leaf disease. Further spread, and you guys are needed in this effort. Here's a look at a really progressed version. Oh, don't know what happened there of beech leaf disease. You can see that the that darkness uh, becomes like more prevalent throughout the leaf itself. Although even if you looked at up, uh, up through light up towards the canopy, you'd still probably see a bit of striping. But this is what it looks like when it's really progressed, like dark, crinkly, very, very thickened. Um, and as I'm touching it, it almost feels like it almost feels like rawhide. Like, I mean, it is very, very thick. Uh, and what I didn't mention before is that this disease, uh, most scientists will agree, is caused by... So I want to point out the fact that it feels like rawhide because sometimes you see wilted leaves for other various reasons. But I mean, this is like seriously thick. It feels like leather. It's like unmistakable when, when you're out there. So just going back to the PowerPoint, I also wanted to point out that the other thing is like, don't get confused when you're looking up into the canopy. You see how this leaf, is overlapping that one, that's just a shadow effect. Like, it's just that this leaf is in the background. That's not the striping, that's the striping. So hopefully you guys can see that difference between what a shadow is of a leaf under another leaf and then the actual striping. That's what you're looking for. That's the hallmark feature. Um, the only things that I think that people might confuse it with, like a beech leaf has the waves at the end, Birch leaves, um, I don't know, some, some people confuse birch and beech, maybe just because they sound the similar, but um, birch leaves have a, like high serrations on it, almost like a, like a tomato knife or something, lots of serrations versus the cresting of the wave. Um, you could also see other types of diseased leaves. Um, you might see beech anthracnose, but it doesn't have the striping on it. And really anthracnose is, is, a, is a fungus and essentially what it is, is just necrotic growth. It's like a scorched look to it. So that is not beech leaf disease. Also, you might get mites, arenium mites that are feeding on it. And you'll notice that it might cause like a yellow line that they're feeding, but there's not, there's not like that, that pattern of the banding and you won't see the banding on either side of it. So it, it's much, much different than beech leaf disease, which has clear striping to it. And this is my last pitch here, guys buy it where you burn it. This arrived here to the Hudson Valley from Ohio, probably from uh, firewood that was being shipped over. So, and now that we know that we have beech leaf disease here, we want to keep it out of places like the Adirondacks. We do not want, we want to keep the firewood where it is. 
do not transport. 4.2 to 4.4 billion um, dollars a year are in damages to management and lost revenue in the U.S. to firewood insect related uh, issues. So 140 forest pests and diseases are known to be moved through firewood each year. So please be mindful of how and where you are moving firewood. You all know, recognize this probably as the emerald ash borer, which has devastated our trees. Um, this is another one, just like, just like this one, uh, that, that can be moved through firewood and has been moved through firewood. We gotta stop that. All righty, ready for number two. Well, this is another, this is actually another, oops, did it again. Um, another uh, type, this is a, not a plant, but an actual organism. And these are called jumping worms. And um, they are from Eastern Asia, and I'll go over that in a second. Um, but before we get into the details of these jumping worms and what they are, let me just uh, tell you a little bit about something I learned about Northeastern worms in general. So um, very interestingly, very few worms are native to New York. In fact, there were um, northern hardwoods once covered with were once covered with glaciers about 10,000 years ago. When those glaciers retreated, it basically killed all the worms in our region. So even the ones that we see here today, like the night crawlers or the Euro European worms, they were introduced by colonists. Um, of course, they are widely considered as beneficial by the gardening community. And I know that in elementary school, I was always taught that worms are great for soil and, and turning over soil and stuff. And yeah, they're great for composting and gardens, but they also can be de very detrimental, especially this type of invasive worm called the jumping worm. It was typically arrived, it arrived about around 100 years ago, and it's, but has really spread rapidly through our region in the last 10 years or so. Um, they can spread about like 10 meters a year, so they kind of cluster around in these patches, and we really need your help in identifying them because we think that it might actually be associated with beech leaf disease. Um, and so these two are kind of tied together in the way that we're putting them together as part of the survey work. And I'm gonna get to all the details, but going back to this initial slide here, um, if you've ever seen soil that looks like this, like coffee grounds and sort of a really dense layer of worms right below the soil surface, you're probably dealing with jumping worms. And I know that I got them on my own property. Um, and once you start paying attention, you're like, oh my gosh, this thing is here. <laughs> and um, I didn't even know it. So as to why and how they are worms in general, invasive worms in general, how they impact soil chemistry. Well, as I said before, our Northeast forests evolved without worms. Um, so for, you know, eons, essentially in, the, in this area, there were no worms around here, um, especially after glaciation, until we started introducing them here. Um, if you guys have ever been up to kind of pristine forest, you'll know what I mean by this like spongy duff layer, like when you're walking and you're almost like feel like you're bouncing on this like really nice forest floor. That's that spongy duff layer, which consists of fallen leaves, other organic matter, so, you know, kind of just at the top here. Um, and it's a natural substrate for our native woodland wildflowers, tree seedlings, fungi, and microbes. So in an area that's really lightly infested or has no, um, none of these invasive worms at all, you really get nice like layer of soil, um, herbaceous vegetation, very diverse. But what ends up happening is that with these invasive worms, they end up feeding on the topmost layer of the soil, this duff layer, and the, or it's, you know, sort of these upper layers of soil, um, or this good sort of black dirt that a lot of like, gardeners like using, right? But when earthworms are feeding and these invasive jumping worms are feeding, they're feeding on this top layer. And they're almost like taking down that duff layer and those fallen leaves and converting them almost too fast. So the nutrients end up getting stripped from the soil very, very quickly, all the nutrients kind of run off and the trees cannot even take up those nutrients. That's kind of all being recycled and cast out as those grounds, those like coffee grounds as castings from the worms themselves. It destabilizes the soil, it causes erosion. And what ends up happening is that the trees, trees can't even take root. It's just like really easy to pull them out and they're not stabilized at all, causing erosion around our trail system and all because of the action of these invasive worms. They are devastating the forest floors. So 
we are very curious, are our jumping worm abundance correlated with beech leaf disease? This is what's like the final nail in the coffin that's causing beech leaf, the beaches, to not be able to resist this new disease that's moving in. Um, I wanted to talk about those castings again. This is what's coming out the other end of the invasive worms. They look like larger coffee grounds um, and just make mush of the soil so that the, the roots can't even take place. They also lay eggs. So um, these jumping worms, the adults die each winter. Before they do, they produce what are called these cocoons that look like these little tiny like balls um, about the size of a mustard seed. And they survive over winter in soil. And then they end up developing rapidly into these jumping worms. As to how to identify them, I'm going to show you a video in a second. But probably the clearest is if you clear a little part of the forest floor and you see worms that are literally like moving around like snakes and jumping and thrashing wildly, you have a, a, like invasive jumping worms. The other difference between the earthworms or the night crawlers or the European worms and these jumping worms is the clitellum. And essentially on jumping worms, that clitellum, that little band here, almost like a rubber band that's wrapping around it is smooth and it tends to be milky white to gray. Um, on night crawlers, you see how it's here, it's not smooth, it's still segmented, and it's going to be raised a little, like almost like saddle shaped, versus on the jumping worm, it's smooth, it's closer to the head as well. So this little rubber band, you see how the head on a jumping worm is actually really small, and then you got that there? And in European worms, the head is much, much longer relative to the body. So at this point, I want to show you a nice video that I found. Um, that kind of goes through this and some of the impacts of jumping worms on soil. And I believe this is from Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. It's a great little educational video for you guys. I never imagined an invasive species as horrific as these jumping worms. When I saw the first forest that was infested, and as you walk across the slope, just from a person walking, the soil slides down the slope so plants can't get rooted in it. And if the plants are destroyed, the whole plant pollinator network goes down and that's the base of a whole ecosystem. Jumping worms are from Asia. They're in the genus Amynthus. The jumping worms are fairly distinctive, especially by mid to late summer. There's a band around a mature worm called the clitellum. And in a jumping worm that goes all the way around and it tends to be lighter colored in you can really see it very, very clearly here, Light, like really white. You see how small the head is there? The jumping worms, and they're quite aggressive compared to the Europe. N nothing moves like, like night crawlers do not move like that. That is like in real time. They are, they like spaz out. <laughs> it's crazy. It's like not even moving like snakes. They're, they're just moving like, like worms. crazy. They spread faster. They thrash around when you touch them. Uh, they live only in the top couple inches of soil, unlike the European earthworms that will go down anywhere from a foot and a half to five or six feet in the case of the nightcrawler. So they live on the very surface. The concern about jumping worms is that they cause soil erosion. See how easy the they roots are coming out there? The top two inches of the soil into small granules or pellets that look like cat litter or coffee grounds. So it's just loose on the surface of the soil. And when you get a heavy rain, it can erode away and degradation of our forested ecosystems and probably loss of native biodiversity like our native plants. We have over 400 native plant species in these maple, basswood and oak forests in Southern Minnesota that could become endangered. And once the plants change, then you change the vegetation that changes the habitat for wildlife. So Birds, deer, squirrels, everything that lives in the ecosystem, butterflies, pollinators, could all be very negatively impacted by this invasion. So this is a real threat to native biodiversity in Minnesota. We need to limit it as much as possible. So buy earthworm-free mulch. If you have earthworms in your mulch, don't spread that around. Don't buy anything on the internet for making your own compost or for fishing bait that has jumping worms in it. It's really interesting how this is also related to fish, fishing, right? I mean, just think about the worms you're putting on your hook. 
what happens when you go through your worms and you're not, you're done for the day. Sometimes people dump them over. So it's like a bait problem as well as it is like moving mulch from one place to another um, is, is also another cause of this. Or don't buy anything anywhere that has jumping worms. If you're hiking around in a forest, make sure you clean your hiking boots afterwards because the eggs could stick. So we are increasingly putting these boot brush stations there. And this actually matters for worms too, because remember they're laying their cocoons, right? Those eggs that which can uh, persist and, and last on your boots. Stick to your, your boots. And if you find these worms, make sure you report them. There's a thing called EDMAPS, E-D-D-M-A-P-S. Don't worry about EDMAPS for now. So we're, um, we're gonna, I'll tell you about the reporting in part two of the survey training. We will not be using EDMAPS. They are. But I just wanted to go through this, that all of this kind of stuff is what we're doing here as well. Like even we've changed like how we're doing plant sales that it used to be from master gardeners, kind of taking them from their own gardens and then putting them out. But if you've got earthworm, if you've got these, um, you know, bringing these big pots and you've got jumping worms in that and then you're giving it and putting it somewhere else, that's another way of it spreading. So uh, this is really kind of focused on ID. And I wanted to just give that as some like educational stuff too, as to how to prevent further spread as well. Okay. And I promise I will take questions at the end. I'm sure you guys have lots of questions on this stuff. All right, species number three, we've got another animal, spotted lanternfly. And I don't know if how many on the call have seen this, but they are on their way. And spotted lanternfly, I dealt with quite a bit last year <laughs> i still have nightmares about this thing um and we are really trying to keep our best to keep this thing out of new york state um, i'll show you where it is right now and and uh we put a lot of effort into keep it and being on top of where these areas are of reporting um but essentially spotted lantern fly is an invasive plant hopper it can fly but it tends to hop around it's native to china and Vietnam, but was introduced to Pennsylvania in 2014. And why it's so devastating is that it feeds on over 70 different host species. Today, we're gonna to be focusing on its primary host, which is Tree of Heaven, which you can see here, um, but it feeds on all sorts of things, um, maple trees, walnuts, um, plum trees. And the reason why there's so much effort going into this is not only affecting our natural areas where we like to hike and recreate, but it's an agronomic crop pest, so it is feeding on grapes. This is impacting vineyards, hops industry, as well as apples, which are all big business here in New York State and New Jersey. So the first sighting in New York State of spotted lanternfly was in 2020, and that happened to be in Staten Island. Um, and since then, we have been monitoring and tracking this thing. So it started here in Pennsylvania and has expanded south and east. It's now found all throughout New Jersey. And very, like last year and the year before, we were on top of this thing in New York State. It's now found in Orange, Ulster, Westchester, Putnam, and Rockland counties, but in really low abundances. And even in New Jersey, it's found in, in, in patches, right? So it's not all hope lost there. It's just a matter of where it is and how common it is. And we can go after these things in these limited abundance areas. Even though it's, it's widely distributed in certain areas, we are doing our best to keep this thing out of New York State. Um, I wanted to briefly go over its life cycle. So right now, um, uh, it's just coming out of egg laying. So it's got a one year cycle. These are the, these are the adults and they've been lay, they were laying eggs back in September through November, then the adults die. And then these eggs, which look like little putty masses are now hatching. And I just got word from Department of Ag and Markets that three days ago, there was a first reporting of hatching down in the Bronx. And when they catch from these egg masses, I'm not gonna focus a lot on the idea of the egg masses and not even really of the adults because this is what we're gonna be looking for over the next couple of months. This one right here, when they emerge from these egg masses, they're gonna look like little beetles with polka dots. And I've got kind of a fun video to show you of this, um, of what they look like during this nymph stage as they're hatching. So over the next month or two, and they stay in that instar or that stage of development, for the next month or two, they're gonna look like these little beetles. And I'll show you like a quick video of what they look like. They're kind of scampering around here. This is kind of a, a fun video to show you guys. Oh, wait a minute. I think this is an invasive. I might know what this is. This is uh, not me talking. This is a video that I found of these guys scampering around because it had really good uh, camera angle on it. They run like a giraffe. 
<laughs> they do. Yeah, have you ever seen sure. a giraffe running? They do look like they run like a giraffe. I'm sure, this is the first instar of the nymph stage of the lanternfly. And this Later is in real time. In August, they'll be red, white, and black. And after that, they're going to have their adult form, which I'll show you later. Now, since they're black and white, uh, that's aposematic coloration. This is a really good picture of it. This is a really good camera angle. So you can see these white polka dots against the black. And then these also these like, um, like really small spots that are there as well. So that's what we're looking for at this for the next couple of months, they're gonna be in this stage. And they're really, really tiny. So if you can see my finger, I mean, you're talking about like, not, not super tiny. I mean, they're big for, I guess, for, for a bug, um, but they're like bigger than an ant at this point. To me, it suggests that they're either toxic or they taste really bad. So therefore, they don't really have any natural predators in our area. They so this is just a really good still footage of what you're looking for. Um, at this point, they're going to be about a quarter of an inch long. Um, and they will feed. I'll talk, talk to you about their feeding in a second. But at this stage of life, they're really going for succulent growth. So things like leaves or like softer tissue. They can't feed on the bark at this point of a lot of their host trees. So if we're taking a look at its life cycle again, during this stage, they're feeding on succulent growth. And as they get bigger, they start to expand to about three quarters of an inch at this instar stage here. And then eventually, they're going to turn from this black sort of nymph stage into a reddish instar. This guy here, they eventually end up like taking off that black skin. And then you get this like reddish with the white dots on the back. And that's not really going to happen until like late July. And then it eventually gets into this adult stage, which you guys may or may not have seen. So this, this reddish look on its back is what you'll start to see later in the summer. Okay, as to why it's become such a successful invasive species, well, it's a prolific reproducer. It replaces itself with 17 of its cells every year on average. And this is what a really bad infestation will look like of the adults. I mean, those are all spotted lanternfly at the base of this tree. Um, they have very few natural predators. Now, I have seen pictures of praying mantis feeding on them. Chickens and some birds will feed on them. Uh, but they, they are not like in the numbers to really kind of keep their numbers down when you got an infestation like this. Predation is just not gonna, not gonna get it done. In their native areas, like in China, there are some parasitoids, so some wasps that can feed on the nymph stages and kind of keep their populations down in their native area. And researchers are looking into biocontrol or bringing these parasitoid wasps over to control the population here in the Northeast, but that's still in the experimental stage. It, it takes a lot of approvals for that to happen. Um, they are a plant generalist. So they will feed, especially at this adult stage, um, on pretty much anything, 70 different uh, types. During the nymph or that beetle stage, uh, essentially, they'll feed on just succulent growth. But when they get to be old, they actually have this mouth part that is strong enough to pierce the side of a trunk of a tree. And just think of this thing feeding like this long proboscis here that is sticking itself into the sides of trees, sucking out the sap and all the nutrients. And think about that as the lifeblood of that tree that it's feeding on, whether it's a vineyard or um, you know, an apple tree or you know, the tree of heaven, which we'll talk about in a second. It's sucking out all the juices. The tree cannot like get the kinds of nutrients that it needs and it really, really weakens that tree. But the thing is, imagine all of that fluid coming into this small bug. It's a really messy feeder. So all of that sap is being pulled out and it's going out the other end. And what ends up happening is that it secretes out the other end a honeydew solution, a sticky sugary solution that smells, it just gets all over everything. And what ends up happening is all of that sugar and all of that like honeydew solution ends up a growing mold on it. And Christy and I were out the other day looking at these trees, just these blackened trees from the sooty mold on bark and vegetation. Um, and what it, what it ends up doing is all this sugary solution as it's feeding, it attracts things like yellow jackets and wasps and bees. So there's all of these swarming insects all around these areas where SLF is found. Now it's, and then you can also get sort of these like sooty mold growing even on your own property if you have a spotted lanternfly infestation. So this is doing huge damage to not only our ecosystems, but our, ag uh, but our economy and agriculture. 
um, thought to be over $320 million in annual loss due to crop damage in Pennsylvania alone. It's currently over $50 million, but the way that it has expanded, it's a huge hit to the economy. So it's something that we're keeping our eye on. Now, all of these images that I'm showing you are really in infested areas, but it's not really a human health threat. It doesn't bite, it doesn't transmit disease. It's not really a property damage threat other than the molds kind of like covering, covering things, but they don't typically enter homes, they don't eat wood, and they generally don't kill the trees that they're, that they're on. They're just kind of weak in them and then they might get killed by something else. They're mostly like a nuisance pest. Uh, so that is spotted lanternfly. And of course, I could go into more detail on the adult spotted lanternflies and what they look like. But for now, just kind of focus on that beetle, that dark beetle with the white polka dots on the back. That's what it's gonna look like for the next couple of months that are under an inch in length. So how do we identify where these things are? Well, it's primary host tree that it feeds on eventually is called the tree of heaven. And for those of you who have been long-term um, surveyors for us, this was on our ISF um, standard list or for a common invasive species because it is common in our region. It's called the tree of heaven. You might also know it as a lanthus and I'll be going over its key features here. So if you have taken previous training with me, I like to use mnemonic devices as well. So for this plant, um, if you're out looking and you're surveying for us, it should be fun, right? So I like to use the mnemonic device where it's like, how do I remember what tree of heaven is? And how, what I features I should be looking for? Be thinking, let the fun begin. So remember these letters, L, T, F, and B because they will be used for how, what keys that you're looking for. You wanna look at, when you're looking at tree ID, you wanna look at the leaf, you wanna look at a twig, you wanna look at the fruit or flower and the bark. So let's take a look at what the leaves of Tree of Heaven look like. So Tree of Heaven leaf itself is what is called a compounds leaf. This whole thing that I'm circling right here on the screen, that's one leaf. And it's actually divided into these little leaflets. And you notice how these leaflets are like right next to each other along this extended sort of stem of this leaf. So you might be asking yourself, well, why isn't that a leaf? Like just this little part here, why is this whole thing a leaf? Well, actually it's this whole thing that falls off a tree in the fall, during the fall or autumn time, this whole thing falls off, not the actual leaflets. So we consider this whole thing to be a leaf. And you'll notice that the leaflets are kind of divided um, right next to each other along this sort of extended stem there. Um, the leaves itself can range between one and four feet in length. And if you look at the outside of the leaves, you'll notice a few things. First of all, at the base of each of the leaflets, you're gonna notice this little notch there. This is a zoomed in look. You see how, first of all, the margin or edge of this leaf is nice and smooth, but here at the end, it's got a whoop and then a bump and even just a little nipple there or a little gland that's at the base of that notch. That's what you gotta look for at the base of each of these leaflets. Here's a, like a really good look at that. That is actually a gland. And you know what? If you rub this with your finger, it would be pretty stinky. If you've ever cut down tree of heaven in your backyard, you'll know what I mean. It's kind of like a burnt rubbery smell, kind of like putrid peanut butter, some people will say, like if something is rancid, that's what it smells like. And it's coming from this oil gland that's at the base of that leaflet. Um, you can also look at, for other signs, you can look at a twig. And I'm gonna show you this in the video in a second, but essentially um, where that leaf falls off of the plant, it leaves behind a little scar. And the scar of where that leaf used to be, is kind of like, like a heart shaped maybe, or if you flip it on its side, it kind of looks like Pac-Man eating, eating one of his Pac-Man bubbles or whatever those things, those food items are. Um, so that's another way to look, like where has the leaf fallen off? And what does the scar look like that it leaves behind? Um, it also has a lots of little tiny bumps or these white marks around the leaf scars or on the twigs itself. Those are called lenticels and they're used for oxygen exchange. If you cut into the twig itself, you notice that it's got a brown Twinkie filling in the middle. That's called the pith. So all of these things you could use if you wanted to. But I, I typically look at leaves. You could also look at its fruit or seeds. So tree of heaven has seeds, they're called wing seeds or samaras. And they look like big eyeballs and they come in patches. And sometimes they're yellow. In the winter time, they'll be these like uh, tannish kind of look to them, like a big eyeball in the middle, right? Um, and this is what they'll even persist on the tree afterwards 
um, and uh, like kind of come in like almost like tufts of hair or something. Um, in the springtime, you might see them as pink as well, but essentially they're winged seeds, sort of like a winged maple seed, but more eyeball shaped, right? Okay, you can also look at the bark. If you wanted to tell just by the bark alone, if you go up to it and you feel it, it feels like cantaloupe rind. Do you see, have you ever felt the, uh, the, uh, the outside of a cantaloupe? That's what Tree of Heaven feels like from the outside. So I'm gonna go into um, an ID video for you guys as to all of these different features and how you can distinguish it in the field, okay? So Tree of Heaven, the primary host for spotted lanternfly, we're linking these two things together. Let's take a look at how to ID it in the field and what it might look like in a second. All right, here we go, Tree of Heaven. This was filmed in early May of last year. So it's not, the leaves are not quite as advanced, but I'll show you what it looks like this time of year as well. Of what Tree of Heaven looks like when it's really young, then also when it's mature at this time of year. I'm filling this on June 26th to give you a good sense. But you can see this big tree here. Do you see how it's got that cantaloupe rind look to it? It almost like has little rivulets on it. And if you felt it, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. It feels like cantaloupe. That I mentioned in the PowerPoint. And if you look up, I know it's going to be a little bright up there, but it's got almost that like palm tree kind of look to it. So as you can see here, you know, it's got those opposite leaflets that are coming off of it. But I can tell from that sort of like cantaloupe rind that I'm looking at a tree of heaven. But let's take a quick look at this one here, which is really low to the ground, and you can see what it looks like in, when it's immature or a very young version of the Tree of Heaven. Remember how I told you that you can look at the leaf scars? Well, here's a really good look at the leaf scar here. Remember, it's got almost like that heart shape to it, like Tree of Heaven, love, heart. And this is where the big leaves, remember that these are big leaves uh, that, are, that consist of leaflets. So what you're looking at here, will eventually this whole thing is a leaf and where it connects to that stem that will eventually fall off and then leave these little leaf scars behind as you so you see where that connected that's where it falls off and that's what leaves behind the scar you can see here so again that leaf scar is a good way to look at it and you can take a look at the bark it's got all those lenticels and then the leaf scar here let's take a look at these leaflets and what they look like so remember that these are very very smelly and the leaflets are coming off opposite of one another. so as i'm holding it you see that notch at the base there and you can even see the glands there but it's got a smooth edge to the side there's no like teeth on the edge right except for this one big notch with the gland on it and you can see always look at my thumb for scale right this is about the scale that you're looking at another and if i zoom in very very close there let's take a quick look hopefully it focuses you see right above where my thumb is that little notch there with the gland on it and that is that is what's going to give it that distinctive odor so if i pulled this off right crunch it up in my hands smell it yep it's got that burnt kind of smell to it especially when it's been raining it's a little dry right now and the, the smells are not as strong but this one actually has a double notch on it so you might see a single notch or double see, two, notch one on two but remember the edges of these leaves are smooth unlike sumacs and uh, walnuts, which also kind of look like it, but it doesn't have those smooth edges. And they also don't have those uh, those notches at the back like Tree of Heaven does, right? So look for those smooth edges on the leaflets, the notches at the base, because remember that the others are all serrated, but Tree of Heaven- I'll go no, over that in a second. has smooth edges. So again, that's a good way to tell, and that's what the immature ones look like. Look for those leaf scars. And then again, for the older trees, you can see it grows straight up with almost no branches there. All that cantaloupe rinds look to it, and that's a great way to tell. Tree of Heaven, and it's almost like shrub-like looking form when it's very young, and then it's mature look form, almost that palm tree of the Northeast look to it as I, as I look up into the tree. Yeah, and I saw, I think it was Larry that said in there, it is, it's the tree that's featured in a Tree Grows in Brooklyn, and it's because it's like rising up against adversity, um, and it grows straight up, that's why it's called the Tree of Heaven, it like very thin uh, trunk growing straight up to heaven, 
and it almost looks like a palm tree as it's going straight up. And that's the thing. It could grow in Brooklyn because it could grow through like sidewalk cracks and things. And it was used and brought over as a shade tree, in fact. So tree of heaven, palm tree of the Northeast. That's how I see it. Um, so that video that I showed you there was actually from um, like May. You're going to see that in a few weeks. Now, if you just went outside right now, it's not quite grown out yet. So that's why we kind of wait, want to wait to start the survey season for another couple of weeks, because this is what it looks like now. You can see that the leaflets are coming out opposite of one another on here, but it's just the little tufts right now that, that, you're, that, you, that you can notice. And to me, it looks like Phineas and Ferb haircut. Like I told this to Christy the other day, it's almost like little tufts of hair on the end that are growing out, but eventually you'll get these really, really broad leaves. Um, it can grow in a shrub-like fashion, as I mentioned before. Um, you can see that it, uh, these are the flowers of it, but it almost can look like a shrub. It doesn't always grow straight up, but typically this is that palm tree appearance that I was telling, really, really skinny, growing straight up to heaven. Um, I said that it could also look like sumacs. People get it confused with sumacs, but sumacs, unlike tree of heaven, have these little fruit droops in the middle. But if you remember, what are the fruits? of tree of heaven, it's the little winged seeds, not these droops, right? So if you see this, it is a sumac, and sumacs have serrations on the edge of their leaves. Sumacs have these droops, um, but the tree of heaven has those winged seeds. Okay, we are gonna be just a smidge over time, so if people gotta sign off at 8.30, no worries, go do your thing tonight. We're probably gonna wrap up in about five to 10, five to 10 minutes more because we are on our last species. Um, but if you got to sign off, I totally understand. And we will have this on, rec um, on recording and I'll send this out immediately uh, following this webinar or at least within the next 24 hours. So the last species for you guys is every month, um, we are gonna feature a, um, like a rotating species that shows certain features. And our May species is called incised fumort. And Christy, who I keep talking about here, is our new uh, EcoQuest guru, and she is so good at production value and everything. Christy, you want to say hi to everybody? So she'll be producing um, these monthly um, videos for us. And in May, we're featuring this one called incised fumort. And then in uh, June, we'll be featuring another one. So for all of you surveyors out there, what's going to happen is the other four species that we talked about will be every month. And then if you happen to go out surveying in June, you'll also be looking for the June species that we're featuring. And they're mostly gonna be invasive plants. But if you happen to go out and survey in July, you'll be looking for that July species. And if you wanted to look for all of them that we featured throughout the year, all go for it. I'm not holding you back. <laughs> all right, Chrissy, you wanna say anything else about it? Nope. <laughs> I think you got, you covered it. <laughs> yeah. And you'll be re just, just to reiterate, you'll be releasing these at the beginning of the month typically. And Christy right. is so good at these videos. She's, she's magic with this stuff. So, um, uh, we, I'm going to show the one for May right now and get right into it, but it's in size fumort. You're looking for purple flowers. So next time you're out hiking, look for purple flowers and the way to kind of tell in size fumort are the vuvuzelas. I'm probably not saying that right, but if you've ever been to an international soccer game, you know what I'm talking about. Those big horns that they blow um, in between, uh, you know, nice plays or whatever. Um, they're really elongated um, and they have a purple look to them. Uh, they end up clustering four inches long, 10 to 16 flowers per bunch. And their leaves kind of look like, like parsley or carrot leaves. So I'm going to show you Christy's video that she made for this month. If you're ever interested in doing more of these, you should sign up for our EcoQuest challenge and you get um, emails with these every, every month as well. But as part of now we're integrating it into our actual survey surveys, you'll be notified from us as well. So let's take a look at that EcoQuest. Just gotta find the right browser here, folks. Here we go. And of course, Christy gets to come up with fun titles and this month is Thwart Inside Inside Fumor. Here you go, guys. During this month's Lower Hudson Prism's Invasive Strike Force EcoQuest Challenge, we're going to learn to thwart incised fumort. Incised fumort, or Cordalis incisa, as you Latin lovers like to call it, is a biennial shade tolerant forb, or herbaceous flowering plant in the poppy family, related to bleeding hearts and to the showy garden perennial spring fumort. Native to Eastern Asia, it is uncommon in the horticultural trade, but may spread in soils for shipments of other plants or be sold as seeds and bulbs for medicinal uses. 
While widely distributed, incised femur is still uncommon in the mid-Atlantic, making it an early detection species that may still be erratic. So if you look at all these, all these uh, dots here, that's where we currently know it is, right? And then we're looking to track this more. So really along the Bronx um, and other parts of, uh, uh, I think it's found in, also in northern New Jersey. Two species that may still be eradicated by a region-wide rapid response. Just on the edge. This species of is typically New found in floodplains and along small streams and well-drained soils and habitats, and can grow very densely along riverbanks. Did that Bubazella? To identify this species, New York New Jersey Trail Conference and Lower Hudson Prism Terrestrial Invasive. The reason why we're focused on this is that Ryan, who's our terrestrial coordinator, our crew has been actively working on this for a while in, in active management. So we're trying to link our survey species with active management to see it on the back end. The species project manager, Ryan, will go through the plant's key features. So this is incised fumor, Corydalis incisa, and it has that incised in its name because these leaves are very fringy and have some deep lobing in them. Uh, you can see that the plant is green, but these leaves, especially at the edge there, have a kind of purplish red tinge. The stem is also a bit purplish red. It's very herbaceous and it's almost square in shape. Definitely. See how he's like kind of moving it with his thumbs. If you felt that, it would feel like a square kind of. It wouldn't roll. It's not rounded. It has some deep ridges in there. Um, and you can also note that there is a purple bell shaped flower. Today is uh, April 28th, so we are in flower now. Um, and if you look over here, you can see another sort of fringy looking plant. This is mugwort. Um, and you can tell the difference between incised fumor and mugwort um, because this isn't nearly as lobey or fringed. Um, and it's a lot more robust looking. The fumor is kind of delicate looking. Um, and you also don't have that red stem on mugwort um, and you don't have that red purplish tinge to the leaves either. Thank you, Ryan. During this month, also keep an eye out for the native lookalike species yellow fewwort, which indeed has yellow flowers. When not flowering, these two species may also be distinguished by the color of their stems. Incised fewwort stems are reddish at the base, while yellow fewwort stems are green. Identification is the first step toward plant control. Now, and that this was actually filmed at a removal event. So we really want to link the survey with the management this year, and that's the reason why we're featuring it. So, um, just to get back to the PowerPoint, the main thing the these these monthly rotating ones, the main thing is that we're really focusing on like obvious features. Look for something purple that looks like a bubazella. That's really all it is to it. It should be very obvious. Um, and then these other features that Ryan was pointing out, the leaf shape and stuff, those are secondary. But if you can just remember, look out for these purple flowers uh, along the way. Because right now we're just finding these uh, along the Bronx, but we, we have a feeling that they're much more widespread. Really need your help with mapping it. All right, that wraps up the five species. The next steps for you guys, uh, I know that there were some questions about, well, what do we do? We got to report it, right? That is part two of the training. So today was just about ID. Let's learn about why we're featuring these, uh, what they are and what its main features are. Um, you are going to have lot, like access to all of these videos. I'm taping this webinar. So before you go out and survey for us, you'll be able to review this stuff. Um, and yeah, so those are essentially the next step. So make sure if you haven't already, sign up for this, um, for a live stream webinar that goes over the protocols on May 26th. Once you viewed and attended that second webinar, you're then gonna be ready for a field assignment. You're gonna have access again to all of these. You'll have access to our digital library with short, about five minutes uh, species spotlights and field guides for you. You'll um, have a subscription to our monthly EcoQuest challenge video so you know what the feature species is that month. And we are here for questions at any time. Christy and I are working together on this stuff um, and happy to help you guys out. Um, once you are through that training part, um, I, I know there's a lot of returning surveyors. It's gonna be the same thing. So 
wherever you want to go survey, say it's a trail you've been wanting to explore, a trail you've always explored, and you're like, oh my gosh, now my eyes are open. I'm ready to go like map these invasive species in this trail I've been on thousands of times. It's up to you. Whatever convenient for you, it's open. Open to where whatever you know the trails that you want to visit and report for us. When we get this assignment in June, you'll have the full summer to early fall to complete it. It's usually going to be about a one to two mile trail section that you'll be looking for these five invasive species. We're going to go over all of that in the next training session. Once you're done, you're going to submit your data. And then, of course, our gratitude and appreciation for volunteering, doing all the work with us. So with that, guys, I am happy to take questions. I'm going to stop the recording there. And again, I will make this available for you guys and we're not going anywhere. Yeah, this is ending at 8.30, but I'm here to answer as many questions as you guys have. And if you gotta go tonight, no worries. We're here over email um, and you can contact us anytime at this above email address. Thank you all. I'm happy to take questions now.